Before we begin today's episode of Potterless, I just wanted to thank all of you guys for making February an incredible month. Listen to this. If you took all of our listens from when we started in October through January and doubled them, it's still significantly less than the amount of listens we got in February. That is insane. And thank you guys so much for leaving reviews on iTunes. People found out how to leave reviews on Facebook, which I didn't even know was a thing. So thank you guys so much. One little favor that I have to ask, if you can just think of one person in your life that might like Potterless, Why don't you go tell him about it? If you're like, you know who would love Potterless? Bill. And if Bill's your dad, that's even better because I would love families to come together and listen to my silly podcast. I also want to give a shout out to our newest Patreon supporters, Vicky Garcia and Matt Bricknell, and a huge super special shout out to our three new producer level patrons, Leanne Davis, Griffin Meckelberg, and Michael, who didn't put his last name, but these three are now official producers of Potterless, meaning I will be saying their name in every episode, throwing a random compliment their way, and being eternally grateful because with their pledges, I'm going to be able to do stuff like buy a new microphone, and I'm super excited about it. So anyway, guys, thank you so much for everything, each and every one of you. You're all amazing. And let's get right into the next episode of Potterless, starring Jordan Edwards, who's on the board for LeakyCon, which is incredible. So let's get into it. Hello, Internet. Thank you so much for returning to our journey through Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. We are today covering chapters 13 through 16, and we are joined today by the lovely Jordan Edwards, who is on the staff for uh, LeakyCon, the Harry Potter Con Convention Conference Magical Wonderment, which starts tomorrow <laughs> at the time of recording oh this. God. Jordan, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Mike? I'm doing very well. Uh, I did not know that LeakyCon was tomorrow, so this is super super excited and whenever this episode gets posted months in the future uh, it'll be old news but there will be another one i'm sure (laughs) i'm excited i'll have i feel like i'll have to go because by that time i will have read all the books and i need to express my newfound love there you go and and that's the perfect place for it (laughs) beautiful before we begin what is your harry potter house so my hogwarts house is ravenclaw nice okay i always knew i was a ravenclaw even before there was such thing as pottermore like (laughs) um i always identified with uh, the cho chang character Mm -hmm. that sort of like nerdy bookish because you're an attractive Uh, asian woman that's right that's exactly (laughs) what i look like (laughs) um no i've always been a ravenclaw so nice um, my one issue that I have is that the official merch and things that Warner Brothers produces for Ravenclaw has a raven as the symbol, and that is not the symbol of Ravenclaw. What is the symbol? symbol, It is an eagle. It is a, a our colors are, are blue and bronze, and our, our symbol is an eagle. But someone missed that note. <laughs> the intern who was doing the artwork <laughs> for uh, Warner Brothers just assumed that Ravenclaw would have a raven. Well, why so, why isn't Ravenclaw a raven? I feel like that would make so much sense. Because Gryffindor's a griffin. <laughs> Gryffindor's a lion. <laughs> oh, it's a lion? Damn it! <laughs> None of this makes any sense. I think I guess Slytherin, Slytherin's is maybe the one that makes the most sense out yeah. of all of them. So, Man, that's but, so funny. Yeah, yeah, I will say I went to I went to Harry Potter World twice and uh-huh. both times I noted that the merchandise that wasn't Gryffindor Slytherin was severely lacking. Oh yeah, we we have actually a panel I think coming up at LeakyCon called Ravenclaw Erasure. So it's like <laughs> the, <laughs> this idea that like everyone is either a Griffin or a Gryffindor or a Slytherin and like they're excluding all these other folks who identify as Hufflepuffs and Ravenclaws. So. Yeah, I always felt growing up, like, I never read the books, like, until now, but I always right. felt like Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff were super pushed to the side. And they Ravenclaw were. even more so than Hufflepuff, because Hufflepuff kind of was, like, the New Jersey of uh, Hogwarts, <laughs> where, like, at <laughs> least everyone Hufflepuff. made fun of it. And I'm from New Jersey, yeah. so I, like, got that. It was like, oh, well, at least everyone's making fun of Hufflepuff, so they're noted. Whereas Ravenclaws yeah. are just like, oh, the nerds, let's not talk about them I ever. Know. I guess it's because we were all locked up in our little tower doing our homework <laughs> yeah, we're too busy and never studying. involved in any adventures. <laughs> So, no, um, I like that we, you haven't gotten to meet Luna Lovegood yet, but when you do, she'll she'll represent Ravenclaw. Yeah, so we're starting with chapter 13, and I think this is the first time you meet... Oh, no, wait, is Penelope Clearwater from Hufflepuff? Uh, or no, I mean Ravenclaw? I think she is. 
I was going to say this well, chapter. Yeah, that sounds right. I think I she's ho- she's uh, Ravenclaw. I was going to say that this Quidditch match, Gryffindor yeah, versus Ravenclaw, Ravenclaw, is the first time you meet people from Ravenclaw <laughs> like, halfway through the third book. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, those guys, right. The, yeah. <laughs> so, chapter 13, Gryffindor versus Ravenclaw. So, as I've informed you before we started recording, and as everyone listening probably knows by now, I despise Quidditch and everything it stands for. Uh, so, I join you in that. <laughs> Good. That's that's exactly why you're on the podcast. That's going to be a new requirement. Do you hate Quidditch? G- okay, good. You can be on. My first note that I wrote down, all caps, oh, great, another Quidditch chapter. So, <laughs> so basically, this chapter starts off with uh, Ron and Hermione being very upset with each other for the whole Scabbers versus Crookshanks incident. Mm-hmm. Harry sides with Ron, which makes sense since Hermione's cat basically just attacked Scabbers out of nowhere and yeah. there's blood. Uh, but Hermione doesn't take that very well. No. <laughs> she she really loves her cat. She thinks her cat's always in the right. Mm-hmm. And Crookshanks is a mysterious little bugger. Yeah. So, we run into more mysteriousness in Chapter 16, which I'm really intrigued about. Yeah. The other Weasley family uh, tries to cheer him up in the best way, which is basically Fred and George being like, oh, come on, Ron, you didn't really like Scabbers that much anyway. <laughs> you always <laughs> complain about him being terrible. They have a unique way of, uh, of cheering people up. Yeah, uh, I <laughs> love Fred and George so much. I know. Ron is like, but wait, what about that one time when he bit Goyle's finger? And then Fred and George sarcastically say, ah, his finest hour. Let the scar <laughs> on Goyle's finger stand as a last tribute to his memory, which is so good. Scabber's finest hour. Uh, really? I, mean, <laughs> I don't blame him. Goyle's kind of a nasty little... No, they man. seem like really bad, mean, horrible people. <laughs> yeah, um, they're not the best. <laughs> so Harry brings Ron to Quidditch practice to try to cheer him up. And he's like, oh, you can ride on the Firebolt. And that's apparently the greatest thing in the world. So, yeah, well, when you're Ron Weasley and all you've had is this dinky, like, back alley, like, crap <laughs> broom your whole life, I think getting to ride a Firebolt. Is yeah, you have, like, the Swiffer Wet Jet 3000 yeah. or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like Mary Sanderson, like, riding, like, the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> it's totally like off brand not even not even close. yeah like the handheld dust buster just a really bad <laughs> <Yeah>. vacuum <laughs> so yeah. oliver wood is talking about the game that's coming up and he says that cho chang is the seeker for ravenclaw uh mm-hmm. and my note here is is every important person in the harry potter universe a seeker because it seems like if you're an important character you have to be a yeah. seeker Cedric Diggory's a seeker. It like there's a little seeker <laughs> click, right? Yeah. It's the, you know, Harry and Draco and Cedric and... Cho Chang now. Uh, Cho Chang, all the important characters. Yeah, it does seem like. <laughs> I think it's because that role is so important to the quote-unquote game uh, <laughs> that, you know, they, they want to draw special attention to these people. Important, a.k.a. the only position that matters. <laughs> really matters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Harry's first time riding the Firebolt, and it's incredible. He's going super mm. fast, and he's loving it. I was personally afraid that when he gave it to Ron that he was that Ron was going to crash it or something. <laughs> but thankfully that doesn't happen. And then on their way back from practice, uh, they bump into Crookshanks in the dark, but Harry is convinced that it was the eyes of the Grim, which is mm. some sketchiness, which comes up later in chapter 16. So at breakfast the next day, all of the students are oogling over the firebolt and they're freaking out about it. Malfoy is super jealous, obviously. And then Percy comes up to Harry and tells him that he needs Harry to win the Quidditch match against Ravenclaw because A, he's bet his girlfriend, Penelope Clearwater, 10 galleons on the outcome of the match. And B, he doesn't have 10 galleons. And this raises <laughs> a lot of questions. First off, if you're having a bet with your girlfriend, why isn't it something like playful or creative? Like, oh, well, the loser has to do a give the other a massage or like yeah. clean the, their laundry well, or like something. Don't bet a thing that you don't have. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. It's like, first off, don't bet your girlfriend money. And second, yeah. like, don't bet her money when you don't have the money. Because how my cool, favorite like... Thing is, is how Percy loves to make sure everyone knows he has a girlfriend. Yes. He's like, brings it up at every opportunity. <laughs> By the way, my girlfriend, did I tell you I have a girlfriend? Her name is Penelope. She's my girlfriend. <laughs> We get it, Percy. We get it, Percy. You found someone that would put up with your terribleness. (laughs) I don't know how she's dating him. He seems atrocious. Yeah, he's rough. 
<clears throat> she must be very tolerant. She really must be. Malfoy snarks that the firebolt should have a parachute on it because of Harry falling off with the Dementors. And then Harry says, well, your broom should have an extra arm to catch the snitch. And immediately Malfoy just hey. turns around and goes back to the table. <laughs> Bazinga. Uh, exactly. Yeah, he... It really proves like Malfoy's the worst bully. Like his insults aren't very yeah. good. And no. he makes fun of orphans and people with poor parents. And he's just yeah. a bad bully. I mean, he's a like very kind of stereotypical bully. Like, it's just weak. Like, <laughs> it's covering his own insecurities and like, yeah. He's the, a pretty pretty standard bully. In, mm, yeah, that very run-of-the-mill. Yeah. So this so this big match is about to begin. Harry sees Cho Chang at midfield and notes that he thinks she's very cute, setting up further love tri- situation that I know happens later in this uh-huh. series. Uh, it and really does. Uh, but, but she gets she gets him in the something, end. Something because I don't know how anyone could look cute in those Quidditch uniforms. Yeah, like they're like she, big. She must, robes. He must really be attracted to Cho Chang if he finds someone in those Quidditch uniforms. Well, I, yeah, I think the exact wordage of the book was that he said her face was very cute, and I think that. That's the only thing you can see in those you big baggy see. Quidditch <laughs> robes. Well, I guess that works. <laughs> so I think that's about it. Yeah. Lee Jordan, the announcer, the whole time is just raving about the Firebolt. Uh, and McGonagall <laughs> pipes in asking if he's being sponsored by them. Which is, <laughs> McGonagall in this book is like going to another level of sass. Oh, yeah. And I love it. It's so She's good. so sassy. <laughs> She's, She's incredible. Ab- one of my absolute favorite characters. Uh, yeah, I, I was like, it. I was lukewarm on her until this book once she started yeah. sassing Trelawney. And oh my. My God, she's absolutely yep. incredible. Cho Chang during the match is basically just following Harry around because she's assuming that he knows where the snitch is, which is like a pretty reliable strategy. I just, mean, so far, yeah, given his record, he's yeah, pretty dang good at what he does. <laughs> exactly. So he's he's flying around, and then out of the like, she freaks out about something and points, and he looks and he sees three Dementors or quote unquote Dementors. Uh-huh. My initial thought I wrote down in my notes was, okay, can we not? Can we just stop them from? <laughs> coming in the Again? game because I don't know like how they keep getting into places but yeah. Harry uses Expecto Patronum he and makes a it's still a cloudy Patronus but he notes that it was like much larger than before so it's not the full-fledged deer so that he yeah, gets he's, later on or yeah the, he's learning he's, he's, bit, he's yeah. getting there but I wonder it, how much of like a placebo effect there is because we find out that these are not real Dementors but mm-hmm. he still like has experiences the like feelings. Yeah. So I'm wondering like if he just if someone could just like spook him and you know because <laughs> dementors have like an actual effect on people. Yes. But I'm wondering if Harry is like is in his own head so much that he you know thinks that these are I real. Mean, and he seems to, to feel be the so terrified by the dementors that I feel like just the thought of one would kind of trigger yeah. him. So I think it would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if he could produce an even bigger Patronus off. These yeah, ones. he's got the adrenaline from uh, from the game thrown in there yeah. too. So just the extra yeah. stress. So he he gets the snitch afterwards, which is nice. Everyone's very happy. Hey. Professor Lupin comes up and is like, "Hey, nice Patronus, but those weren't Dementors." <laughs> and then he looks over and it's just Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle dress up as Dementors. So then McGonagall gives them detention and takes away fifty points, which is like the first time that points being taken away actually fit the crime because they tried to mess with the outcome of a Quidditch match which is like one of the only ways you can get house cup points. So McGonagall makes a great call by taking away 50 points. Uh, McGonagall's sock is just rising so fast. (laughs) So there's a big party in the Gryffindor common room afterwards, but Hermione is reading off in the corner, and Harry's like, come on, you gotta... You gotta stop studying so much, Hermione. (laughs) Ron wastes no time to yell at her again for the whole Scabbers incident. Um, Of course. And then they just, the party ends, McGonagall says go to bed, and Harry has a dream, a vague one about his Patronus having hooves and running through the woods, so this is foreshadowing for his Patronus being being a deer later on. And he wakes up to Ron yelling and freaking out that he saw Sirius Black with a knife, like, (sighs) over his face, and then slash the curtains, and then run away. And no one believes Ron. They're all like, oh, come on, Ron. It's just a nightmare. Get over it. And then McGonagall storms in. It's like, what's all this ruckus? And again, she doesn't believe Ron. They go to the painting, 
And then they're like, oh, whatever, Mr. Annoying Night Guy. Sir Cadagan. There he is. <laughs> Annoying Night Guy. <laughs> <laughs> they they ask him, they're like, oh, did you just let in a man? And he was like, yeah, he had all the passwords written down on a little piece of paper. Fuck, so fucking Neville Longbottom. Oh, Neville. Ruins another He thing. tries so hard and <laughs> fails so hard every uh, time. He really does. <laughs> Why would Sirius Black give a crap about... Ron Weasley. Well, Maybe he thought he was Harry. That's, I think that's what he, they think it is because when Ron is like hyping up the story, what he says is that he like, he woke up to Sirius Black over the top of him. And then mm-hmm. when he, I guess when he realized it was Ron and Ron like woke up, he made a noise and he ran away. And then people are like, why wouldn't you just move on to Harry's bed? And yeah. then they're saying like, oh, because, you know, they would have, if like, if people heard him, they would have shut down the portrait and then all the teachers would have came in and they could have brought right. the Dementors. So yeah, I think, I think you just had to run away. Hmm. Hmm. Intrigue. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the end of chapter 13. So then we move on to chapter 14, Snape's grudge. Oh, Snape. Mm-hmm. Since this incident, security has been amped up to which I'm thinking, yo, send the kids home. Right. And this At is this so point, there's dumb. like an actual murderer, convicted murderer. Yeah. In the school, you should, yeah, definitely. Not even just in the school, but he was hovering over Ron's bed. (laughs) With a knife. With a giant, and Ron's like, it was about 12 inches long. Like, he's got a giant knife in the school. They were going to send kids home for the freaking snake that is, like, turning them into stone or whatever. But they're not, there's a convicted murderer that killed 13 people at once. And he's yeah. confirmed in the school, and they're like, all right, let's just amp up the security. Like, if I was a parent, I'd be like, Hogwarts, send my child home, fuck you. Like, yeah. this is ridiculous. Yeah, it is a bit uh, unusual, but <laughs> their reasoning for this. It's like not a really well-run school. Like, it's so... You could say that. It's <laughs> so There's sh- a lot of shit that goes down <laughs> It's so school. confusing. Someone... <sighs> Is either attempted murder or dies every year. Yeah, every (laughs) single year. And it always gets resolved around finals time. (laughs) Yes, very conveniently. Mm. (laughs) Ron's basically famous now because of this incident. Uh, And he says that Blackout... Oh, this is where all this happens. So he says Blackout over him with a knife, ran away when you noticed it wasn't Harry, etc. McGonagall freaks the hell out on Neville. Gives him detention, says he can't go to Hogsmeade, says he can't have passwords to go home. He has to be escorted in by someone, which <laughs> by is <another> amazing. <laughs> uh, so McGonagall goes crazy on him, etc. His grandmother sends him a howler message. Harry gets a letter from the owls during mail time. I always imagine the Blues Clues mail time song when the owls are flying in, like mail time, and then they all fly in. <laughs> so Hagrid gives Harry a note saying, Ron and Harry, come on over for tea, and They go over, and they're thinking it's about Buckbeak, but it actually turns out to be about Hermione. Apparently, she's been super stressed with school. She's been lonely from the whole Scabbers backlash since Ron and Harry did not take her side in it. And she's been spending all her free time, which is extremely limited from her 12,000 courses that she's taken, helping prepare for the Buckbeak defense. And Harry and Ron are like, oh, shit, we totally forgot to help with that. Drop the ball. (laughs) Super drop the ball. Hermione is the one who keeps them in line, right? She's the one who reminds them to do their homework and turn their shit in. (laughs) Like, she's not talking to them. So they they just get nothing done. Then Ron says uh, he hates that she's defending the cat. He's like, I wish he would just not defend the cat. And then Haggard has the great line that says, yeah, people can be so weird about their pets sometimes, <laughs> which is really hilarious. Like, Coming from Hagrid, yeah. I mean, <laughs> props, he would know. <laughs> props to JK on that one. That's a yeah. funny little joke in there. So this yes. upcoming weekend, uh, it's another Hogsmeade trip. And Yay. Harry decides that he's going to go, even though Hermione is like, don't do it. That's so stupid. <laughs> Harry's like, no, don't worry. I'll wear the invisibility cloak this time. It'll be right. fine. Never listen to Hermione. She never gives good advice. <laughs> yeah. She definitely always gives the best advice and no one ever listens to her. Mm-hmm. And we all see where this ends up. Yeah. She was right every single time, except for when she thought Malfoy was the heir of Slytherin. But other yes. than that, she's got a pretty good success rate of being right about I mean, everything. Yeah. 
She was right about the snake. Like she wrote pipes mm-hmm. question mark. She's been she's got she's other got than that one little, little slip up. No one's perfect. So No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> As Harry is trying to sneak out with the invisibility cloak, Neville bumps into him and Neville's like, "Oh, hey Harry, you're not allowed to go to Hogsmeade either. Let's hang out." And then Harry's like, "Oh no, I'm uh going to the library <laughs> to to write that essay that I got to do." And then Neville's like, "Oh yeah, perfect. I have to write that too. <laughs> we can work on it together." And then Harry's oh, like, "Oh, Wait, never mind. I forgot. I finished it. And then Neville's like, even better. You can just help me with mine rather than have to focus on yours, too. It's like, He's trying so hard. Uh, trying so hard to lose Neville. just Neville. wants a friend. Yeah. <laughs> he just wants a single friend. So then he's like, he's like, okay, let's work on it in the Gryffindor room. So they go to the Gryffindor room. And then once Harry, uh, once Neville gets in through the passageway, Harry's like, oh, wait, I left my essay in the library. And then just fucking ditches him. Ghosts. <laughs> yeah. Typical Harry. Poor Neville probably sat there for probably several hours waiting for him to come back. Reali- and before he realized he'd totally been. Yeah. Ghosted on. Yeah, it's just, it's absurd. The reason that they were first going back to Gryffindor Tower is because Snape saw them and they were like, oh, we're just going to go work on this essay. Then he ditches Neville, goes back, goes through the passageway, and is in Hogsmeade. So he meets up with Ron and they overhear Malfoy and Crabbe and Goyle kind of talking about hoping that Buckbeak is guilty so that he dies, etc. Which is, again, super fucked up. Malfoy's yeah. just the worst. So yeah, Ron, nice. Ron and Malfoy have a little argument, which again centers around Ron being poor, as always. And while this is going on, Harry, with the invisibility cloak, sneaks around the back and scoops up a big thing of mud and then just throws it at Malfoy's <laughs> face, which is fantastic. Yep. Yeah, and like so deserved. Oh, for sure. <laughs> like it was such a, like a yes moment. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, while, while he's doing this invisibility mischief, one of Crab or Goyle, they're the same, uh, one of them like steps on the cloak and Harry's face is revealed and Malfoy kind of freaks out. So immediately Harry has to run back because he's like, shit, Malfoy's going to rat me out. This is really bad. I got to get out of here. So runs back, goes as fast as he can through the passageway. And once he gets through the passageway, Snape is right there. So Snape's like, Potter, come with me. And brings him to the (laughs) office, interrogates him, (laughs) interrogates him because Malfoy told him what happened. He got there first. And Snape, like, doesn't have any concrete proof so he's trying to get Harry to confess but Harry won't do it which is clutch and then he's like really egging him on and he's like oh this is so typical this is just like your father and he basically just starts going on this like anti James yep goes on this anti James Potter tirade and Harry tells Snape to shut up and Snape's like, what did you just say to me? And Harry's like, I told you to shut up, which is like, ugh. <laughs> angsty Harry oh. in full force. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's really so coming not, into not his angsty own. Not playing games at this point, Harry. Not at all. He's really coming into his angsty own in this book, which is great. Yeah. So Anyways. Harry Harry tells Snape, he's like, I know that you only hate my dad because he saved your life. And then Snape's like, oh, did you hear what really happened? And Harry's like, uh, no. And, S- <laughs> <laughs> and Snape, uh, Snape reveals that apparently James Potter and a group of his friends were playing a prank on Snape. And at the last minute, James Potter got cold feet, which is the yep. only reason that he Snape saved Snape's life. And Snape is like, if they had gone through with it, James would have been expelled for sure. And then they're not, they don't talk about it in the future. I'm guessing this won't come up until like book six. (laughs) They're just not going to tell you what happened. I mean, it's hard to, when you kind of come to realize that this like paragon figure in Harry's life, his dad, this like mythological figure Uh is actually not this pristine, perfect person. Yeah. It it adds a lot. It adds a lot to the character. Yeah, it does. And you really start to learn that in this book because in the first two, you're like, oh, James Potter is basically just like Jesus. And then when they, when they reveal that Sirius Black was his friend and the teacher's like, oh yeah, they basically say that James Potter was like Fred and George. And you're like, wait, (laughs) they're not the nicest people ever, but they're my favorites. So they, that instantly was like, yeah, (laughs) but like lovable. Yeah. Like Fred and George. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. Snape then makes Harry empty his pockets. He sees that there's a bunch of Hogsmeade stuff, all this stuff from the toy store. And Harry's like, Mm. uh, Ron gave those to me a while ago. (laughs) And Snape's like, and you kept them in your pocket the whole time? And he's like, oh, yeah. It definitely wasn't at Hogsmeade. It definitely wasn't. (laughs) I promise. Snape uh, finds the Marauder's Map. And he's like, what's this? And Harry's like, it's a piece of paper. And Snape's like, 
sure it is. He tries to get the, the map to reveal what it is, and he's using all these, like, authoritative charms. He's like, Professor Snape warrants the map to set to show yourself or whatever. And then the four founders of the map basically just shit talk him. So I, I wrote down the full quote, all four of the quotes, because they were amazing. So, so well, when they shit talk him, they say, Mr. Mooney presents his compliments to Professor Snape and begs him to keep his abnormally large nose out of people's business. Mr. Prongs agrees with Mr. Mooney and would like to add that Snape is an ugly git. Mr. Padfoot would like to register his astonishment that an idiot like this ever became a professor, which is easily the best insult, followed by the worst insult. Mr. Wormtail wishes Professor Snape a good day and advises him to wash his hair, the slime ball. Of <laughs> so many, like, good building insults, and then the last guy's like, your hair's really dirty. Like, yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so bad so Let, rough letting us down so letting much build up for the worst right. insult <laughs> uh, so Snape calls Lupin in and he teleports through a fireplace which is super cool and I really want them to explain how this works because I know from the movie so I've seen the first four movies and that's all mm-hmm. that's all my knowledge mm-hmm. I remember a few things from this movie and the one thing I remember is Sirius Black talking to Harry through a fireplace so mm-hmm. I don't know if fireplace teleportation is a common thing but it's I think it's a bit like the the um, flu powder okay. transportation stuff. So, like, the way I understand it is it's like if you jump in, you will go to that place. But if you just, like, stick your head in, you, <laughs> you can, talk. You can talk to them. Okay. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, it's like Google Hangouts in the Wizarding World. Nice. Yeah. Whoa. Fireplace would be way cooler than a laptop. Because <laughs> <laughs> <Google. laughs> then I get roast marshmallows and talk to you. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Lupin comes in. And Snape is like, this thing is filled with dark magic. So what is it? And Lupin's like, dark magic? This is clearly a joke toy from, you know, that just insults whoever reads it. Come on, Snape. He's like, come on, Harry and Ron. Oh, I guess, oh no, Ron Ron bursts in and vouches. And like panting frequently, like, I gave those things to Harry a while ago, (laughs) which is just amazing. I wonder how he knew. He must have like knew that he had all the toys in his pocket and was frantically coming up with an excuse for it. Exactly. I don't think Harry sent any sort of distress signal. So I think this was just like a baller move by Ron to like know that. That's good friendship there. Yeah. He knew that if anyone was going to get Harry in trouble, it was going to be Snape. And he knew that if he was going to take him anywhere, it was going to be his office. Just like baller move by Ron. (laughs) panting. <laughs> so Lupin Lupin is like, come on guys, let's talk about that essay that we have to write. And once he gets the other side, Lupin's like, yo Harry, what the fuck? <laughs> like, <laughs> he's like, what the fuck? Why did you not turn in this map? Or why didn't you take the whole black thing seriously? Yeah. Obviously the map makers are going to want you to go out of school because they'll find that entertaining. Also, it has the secret passageways to Hogwarts, which is how Sirius Black is getting in. Like, this is stupid. And Harry like actually feels like shit because Lupin was so nice to him the whole like, time. dropping some truth bombs on him. Yeah. He he gets the basically I'm not mad I'm disappointed speech from I Lupin. I know which is worse. And Lupin's like worse. the most father figure he's had in the series. So yeah. <laughs> it's like pretty heartbreaking for Harry. Yeah. Uh, Ron and Harry go back to the tower and Hermione is there and she's really sad and they're like what's going on and they say that Hagrid lost the Buckbeak case and that's how it ends. So back to back chapters ending on really sad notes. Yeah. Uh, and then we get to chapter 15, the Quidditch final. So yay, another <laughs> fucking chapter <laughs> Chapter about Quidditch. Yay, <laughs> more Quidditch. Yeah, it was Thanks. that one chapter break from Quidditch was too long. I needed more. <laughs> Hermione says that Papa Malfoy basically intimidated the whole jury of governors into voting guilty for Buckbeak. He's um, so corrupt. Yeah, That guy has so awful. much power and so much money that everyone is just <laughs> scared of him. Uh, it's really true. It's really sad. Wait, maybe that's why Hogwarts is so poorly run. Is because their board, he's on the governor board. <laughs> their board of directors just like doesn't stand up for justice. They just do yeah. whatever Malfoy says because he's like intimidating or something. And that could be so, very good point. <laughs> yeah, they got a they got a bad board of directors. So Hermione mentions that there is an appeal process, but she's like probably not going to help. And Ron's like, yes, it will. And she's like, why? And he's like, because we're going to help this time. And apparently that is like the equivalent of saying yeah. like I forgive you because then they like apologize and hug and uh, everything is. 
is okay. <laughs> She's like, I just need help. Yeah. <laughs> Ron's like, <laughs> Ron's like, we're going to carry our weight in this promise we made ages ago. And then yeah, Hermione's like, oh, you forgive me. <laughs> like, sure, Hermione. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and definitely the uh, the help of two 13-year-old kids is going to save this yeah. like, legal case. Exactly. Hagrid meets up with the squad. He's really sad. They're like in the hallways and stuff, and they, they're walking a little bit farther, and they hear Malfoy kind of making fun of the whole thing about how sad Hagrid is. And Hermione just straight up walks up to him and slaps Malfoy in the face, which is that incredible. Enough? It's a literal hold me back moment because she like goes to slap him again and Ron like holds her hand back and then she goes to <laughs> br- br- like take her wand out of her pocket with her other yeah. hand and they like yeah, Harry and Ron have to like them. tackle her to be like, no, it's great. <laughs> like fierce <laughs> Hermione is fantastic. Good. Don't fuck with my Hermione. She will take it out on you. <laughs> she really will. And she probably knows all of the worst spells. So, like, I wouldn't fuck with her at all. No. Like, she'll give you, like, yeah. something that would make you feel like you have to sneeze, but you can't sneeze. Oh. And then you'll just, like, feel that for hours. Oh. Like, can you? Oh, uh, that'd be. That's cruel. Right? It'd be the worst. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ron is shocked by the whole thing, but it notes that he's, like, impressed. So, I think this is the yeah. first time that Ron's been, like, attracted to Hermione, uh-huh. which is great. Yeah. Like, I love, like, ooh, what is this feeling? <laughs> yeah, he just, like, <laughs> likes that she's feisty. Like, that's what makes yeah. him find her hot. I love it. Yep. <laughs> so they go to Charm's class, and right as they're about to walk into Charm's class, Hermione mysteriously disappears, and they didn't see her. So I don't know what this whole, like, how Hermione's going to classes that are scheduled at the same time thing is. I've mentioned in a previous episode that I think she's using some spell that lets her split into, like, multiple personalities oh, or like something. Cl- clones? Yeah, or, like, be in two places, like, something <laughs> like, like that. <laughs> whole army of Hermione is going in all the classes. Yeah, so I don't know how it's working. This is the third time where she's walking with them and then either disappears or teleports yeah. or something. and you know if something happens three times that it's a thing. Yeah, the rule of thirds, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so she disappears, and then after class, they find her in the Gryffindor tower like asleep in front of a textbook and they're like Hermione where were you and she's like oh did I miss class and we're like they're like yeah but we got Trelawney's class in 20 minutes and she's like okay I'll go I just got to talk to the professor real quick and apologize they're going to Trelawney's class Trelawney worst professor in the world somehow is worse (laughs) than Gilderoy Lockhart she's a mess she's so bad so this class they're doing crystal ball reading and Harry Ron and Hermione are just like being smug and sassy the whole class, which is great. They're just like laughing every time Trelawney says something. Ron's ball is super cloudy and Trelawney says something about him like not being able to see what the future holds. And he's like, no, of course, this just means it's going to be really cloudy later, which is <laughs> obviously <laughs> so good. <laughs> so take it literally wrong. Oh, uh, yeah. Harry does his like crystal ball thing and Trelawney like all she does is hold her hands to her mouth and gasp. And Hermione's like, are you kidding? Like this grim shit again? Again, like, give it a fucking <laughs> rest. A, I love that Hermione is, like, on the brink. She has had enough of everyone's <laughs> bullshit, and she is ready to snap at any moment. She really is, especially like, for teachers that seem unqualified. It's fantastic. Yeah, she, can't, she has no patience for yeah, it. Yeah, so Hermione and Trelawney basically get into a full-fledged argument, and Trelawney says that Hermione has, quote, a mundane brain. And Hermione's like, fuck Ooh. this, and just leaves the class, which is, like, completely warranted. If yeah. a teacher basically says you're stupid, get the fuck out. <laughs> yeah. And she does, and she storms out. Mm-hmm. Rather unlike Hermione, like I grant you, it's warranted, but like she loves her classes. She, so. she's a super nerd. <laughs> like, yeah, you've def- she's definitely reached a breaking point. <laughs> yes, for sure. Easter break is approaching again. Why have they never talked about if Jesus is a wizard or not? <laughs> <laughs> Easter break is approaching, and they apparently have a ton of homework, so everybody's really upset. So Ron is going super hardcore on the appeal for Buckbeak, and Harry's been super hardcore in his preparation for the Quidditch final against Slytherin, because Uh. the way that the point system works throughout the season, which is the only thing I like about Quidditch, is that, like, how much you win each game by actually matters. Like, I think that's pretty cool, because then it makes the the non-seekers, like, mildly important, (laughs) <laughs> but you gotta rack up as many as you can because we're gonna get <laughs> seekers gonna win for the rest of yeah. you. But it, it the the only bad thing about it though is like if one team is significantly better than another team, you could have a situation where a team would have to win by like six hundred points in the final to win, and then it's just silly. So yeah, I think like it would be good for seeding purposes, but not necessarily determining yeah, you'd have who to, wins. Like, wipe it clean. Yeah, the like since there's only four teams, like you could just do the seeding. You're you're automatically in the semifinals. 
Right. <laughs> There's only four <laughs> teams. Yeah, so not hard. <laughs> not that bad. Yeah, you make the semifinals every single year. Like you're always making the playoffs. There's a copious amount of hype. And there's a copious amount of nervousness because they have to win by 50. They have to be up by 50 points when Harry catches the snitch in order for them to win. Right. So, so he's got to time it just right. Exactly. Can't just, like, it's got to be perfect. It. The hype is there because Gryffindor hasn't won a cup since Charlie Weasley, the second oldest Weasley, was the seeker. So it's been mm-hmm. it's been a long time. I think it's been like eight years or something since they won. Harry is really determined to win because of Malfoy, not only because of him bringing up the Hogsmeade thing and all this other stuff, but the main reason he wants to win is because of the Buckbeak thing, which is like really cool that Harry wants to like bring it home for Hagrid yeah. in a way. <laughs> yeah. In the school, it gets really heated. Gryffindor and Slytherin is like, they're fighting in the hallways. People are like trying to trip Harry. Oliver Wood oh like God. commands that Harry always be surrounded by bodyguards effectively. <laughs> we need you, Harry. <laughs> yeah, like every time he bumps into <laughs> Crab and Goyle. He can't go out. He can't go out anywhere because of Sirius Black and he has to be surrounded by people because <laughs> Slytherins are trying to kneecap him. <laughs> yeah, how is there more security by students for a Quidditch match because people might trip him as opposed to, oh, I don't know, a convicted murderer murderer trying to kill him with a 12-inch knife. Uh, Excellent Uh. question. (laughs) So the Hogwarts logic for you. (laughs) Yeah, and what, what I think is funny about all this is that last time they were in the finals, in the first book, there was not this much stress. Like, they weren't, like, worrying about it for weeks on end. And also, in the previous book, they canceled the finals because of the snake thing, but they didn't cancel the finals because of Sirius Black nearly murdering Harry Potter in his sleep. They're just like, nah, let the game go on. Like... (laughs) Uh, I think it's because everyone likes Quidditch so much, so they like they really <laughs> don't want to cancel it. Like, but I really like it. So. Oh man, Harry has nightmares the night before just about Quidditch. He has this dream where Slytherin shows up on dragons instead of brooms, and all this intense stuff. He has another dream that he forgot to show up and they had to put Neville in as Seeker, which of course would have been bad. So Harry goes up to get a glass of water in the middle of the night and he looks outside into the grounds of Hogwarts and he sees Crookshanks walking around, but then he also sees Crookshanks walking next to the Grimm and like walking together, which is super strange. I think Sirius Black can disguise himself as a dog, so I don't know if the Grimm is actually like Sirius Black shapeshifting or whatever. That might just be me being misinformed, but I think that's a thing. But I don't know if Crookshanks is someone else or just a cat. Yeah, that... It raises a lot of questions about Crookshanks and, like, if she can communicate. Like, is the first of all, the question is, is the Grimm, like, an actual physical yes. or is it this, like, metaphysical thing? Mm-hmm. And then that raises the question, like, if it's real, can Crookshanks communicate with the Grimm or can she? Can Crookshanks, you know, see it? Yeah, it raises mm-hmm. a lot. I think Crookshanks is... Got a little added mystery here at the end yeah. of this track. Yeah, and Harry is freaking out because he's like, wait a second, if this cat can see it, then it's not just an omen, it's like a real dog. So he tries to right. wake up Ron, and but by the time Ron like gets out of his sleep and they look out the window, they're gone. So gone. they can't tell. So they go to bed, they wake up, they're going to the game. Um, Cho Chang wishes Harry good luck, and he blushes, so... You know, further planting that seed. Um, oh, and then I wrote this down because I just thought of it when I when I was reading it. But after the last game, why did nobody ask him about the Patronus thing? Like, first off, no right. no student knows what Expecto Patronum is. Like, wow. nobody knows. Like, so what there, was that? Yeah, like, why wasn't Hermione like, yo, what was that spell you did? Also, how was using a spell in the middle of a Quidditch match not against the rules? Why was a whistle not blown? Like, you can't have a, a, a wand out there because you could do spells like under your cloak and right. be like you your broom exactly. us don't work us or whatever like <laughs> how, how did he just go away with this completely unscathed it's absurd yeah i think we're, we're coming to a pattern here about hogwarts and rules not necessarily <laughs> being all that uh, enforced not at all they're at the game and basically everyone wants gryffindor to win the other two houses bring like scarlet colored things to root on Gryffindor. So basically 75% of the stands is rooting for Gryffindor. (laughs) So Slytherin has apparently quote, changed their lineup to go for size rather than skill, which raises more questions around Quidditch because first off Gryffindor doesn't have anyone else on the team except for the standard team. And in the second book, they reveal that in the finals of the first year that they lost the match by a ton because Harry was in the hospital and right. they didn't have a seeker 
and they didn't have a substitute. They just like played with six people. And it was right. and it was the worst loss ever. So how can Slytherin just put in different people? I don't understand. Like I think it's more a case of them bullying people into filling the role. They're <laughs> like, <laughs> we don't care. You're going to play this role now. Do it. Uh, yeah. So. The, and then the third thing is that they say that they're going for size rather than skill. But in Quidditch, like I feel like skill would win way better. Because being big in a non-contact sport like doesn't matter. Like that'd be like if you were playing really. a soccer it's, game with a I bunch think it's of an really intimidation tactic. Yeah, I guess it's just it, like if you're just playing... looming over you. Yeah. <laughs> if you were playing soccer with a bunch of really big football players, like that wouldn't put you in an advantage because the fast people would just run away from them. So I feel yeah, like if you're really good at it. flying, you'll just avoid the tall people, and it's like not a competitive advantage <laughs> at all. Like, no, I think it, they're just big blockheaded Slytherins <laughs> are just trying to intimidate. <laughs> oh, man. So the game starts, and their being big strategy comes into full play, which is basically just, like, attacking people and getting called for penalties. So it's a terrible strategy by Slytherin. You would think <laughs> that since they knew that they just have to not be winning, they just have to not be losing by 50 when the snitch is caught, they should just, like, focus all their efforts on catching the snitch fast, or, like, focus all their efforts on scoring a lot with the quaffle. But no, they decide they're just going to, like, beat the shit out of people, and it <laughs> totally backfires. So Angelina scores a goal, and then they, like, ram into her, and then Fred throws Fred throws his bludger club, so they get called a double penalty, so they each get penalty shots. Penalty shots, which is a new thing in Quidditch that didn't exist before. <laughs> now there's penalty shots. But here's the thing. In, Qu- in Quidditch, and this really is just becoming an anti-Quidditch podcast, like, <laughs> in Quidditch, the goals are just, like, tiny rings on a stick, right? Like, they're not right. very big. How would you no. ever score a penalty shot? Like, if you're the goalie, wouldn't you just stand in front of the ring and then not let the quaffle There's go through? three rings. Okay, how big are they? Uh, in the movie, they're probably, he dives across, they're probably, like, 10 feet wide. <gasps> Oh, oh, so you can throw it in any of the three during a penalty shot. Yeah, so oh. the, the keeper's goal is to, like, anticipate what. Oh, ring okay, that makes so much more sense, because I was just yeah. imagining that they had to throw it through, like, the middle one, and then the, <laughs> the, 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 secret, the goalie would just sit in front of there and just be like, and nope. not going to get in it. Okay, that yeah, makes no. so much more sense. Okay, yeah. now I understand when, when Lee Jordan freaks out that Oliver Wood saved two of the penalty shots. Now I understand why he freaked out. It seems really hard to save it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, so, so <laughs> while the, that. while the, yeah, now that, okay, one good thing Quidditch got right. Uh, <laughs> one to 50 things they did wrong. So, as the score is building up, Harry sees the snitch, but he wants to make sure that Malfoy doesn't. So, he flies in other directions, hoping that Malfoy will chase after him and he, and he takes the bait. And that's like a brilliant strategy. Yeah. It should be used way more often. It becomes a super physical game. There's penalties flying everywhere. And there's super dirty stuff where like the Slytherin beaters are hitting the bludgers at the goal when you're not allowed to because you're only allowed to do it when the ball is in the scoring scoring area apparently which is a new rule we learned about new rule. <laughs> so Gryffindor basically gets up 70 to 10 and then Harry's like alright now I just gotta find the snitch we're up by 60 he's about to get it but then Malfoy grabs the tail of Harry's broom which turns out to be against the rules thankfully I was very concerned that he was that this was not going to be called a penalty uh, <laughs> and Hooch is even like I've never seen anyone do that before <laughs> she's like what the fuck is this <laughs> so they get the worst. penalty and the score basically gets to 80-20 and then Malfoy starts diving for the snitch and Harry's way behind but he like goes in in a million miles an hour reaches out with both hands hands, uses one to knock Malfoy's hand away from the snitch and the other to grab it. And then he wins. They win the final. The whole team dogpiles Harry. Wood is crying tears of joy. The fans rush the <laughs> stage. McGonagall's in tears. Like, it's the greatest thing ever. And then Harry thinks, ah, oh, if only a Dementor were here, then I could have easily produced the best Patronus ever, which to me is, like, slightly erotic. Like, it's kind of yeah. like, a, like a, oh, I feel so good. I could just, like, pop a huge boner right now. Like, yes. it was yeah. weirdly like uh, now I have all these weird like thoughts about Patronuses especially because they're I a mean, silvery that, white thing that comes that from your wand has been, <laughs> that has been drawn before that <laughs> you're supposed to think of a really happy time like 
Yeah, there's there's some parallels there. <laughs> uh, so then we get into chapter 16, Professor Trelawney's Prediction, the last chapter that we'll be covering this episode. And this, again, another title that I hate to see. So out of the four t- chapters we've talked today, I've hated all the titles because the two things I hate in this book are Quidditch and Professor Trelawney. And Professor Trelawney. <laughs> this, is, this is a low point. Uh, it's just a rough section. So basically, all the Gryffindors don't want to study for finals. They just want to, like, party, which makes sense. They've won the only thing that matters at Hogwarts. So they have to start studying. Percy apparently is about to take his newt exams, which is the nastily exhausting wizarding tests, which is, quote, the highest qualifying tests in all of Hogwarts. Like, are you fucking kidding me? It's called the newt? The The nastily exhausting wizarding test? Like, (laughs) come on. Yeah, they're the ACTs of... uh, (laughs) Yeah, at least ACT, like, stands for something and isn't just, like, the awfully challenging Mm. test. Yeah, Yeah, they don't don't set you up for a success with that name, do they? (laughs) Nastily Nastily exhausting. exhausting. Hermione's also super stressed, and she has 300 classes. And then Harry and Ron, they say that they're not going to ask about how she's been going to multiple classes at the same time, but then they see her exam schedule, and they see that she has multiple tests... Scheduled at the same time, Something's which up. is like whether or not she's in these classes both or whatever. Like, I feel like there could be a situation where a student would be in both of these classes. So to have fine any finals like scheduled at the same time seems problematic. She's she's got some secrets, this girl. I know. I'm really excited to see what it is. The finals have been super rough for everyone in the squad. All the tests have been really hard. Harry really screwed up Snape's potions one. He thinks he saw Snape write a zero on his score. Real bad stuff. But then they get to Lupin's final, which is the coolest one because it's basically an obstacle course with dark art stuff slowly littered throughout, which is like great. Makes sense. Yeah. It's fantastic. So they get one of the things is like they have to go into a, a cupboard and there's a boggart in there. And they note that Hermione's boggart is that she failed every final, which Ron (laughs) thinks is hilarious. Of course. (laughs) So the squad goes back to the castle and they see Cornelius Fudge. And he says that he's there to serve as a witness to Buckbeak's execution if found guilty. And they're like, oh, that's super depressing. They also find two old wizards that come through. They're from the Committee of Extraordinary Creature Disposal. And one of them has an axe. So you learn that one Uh-oh. is one's just like a committee member and the other guy's like the straight up executioner. Yeah, he's going to do the deed. Mm-hmm. Ron and Harry then go to their divination final where Trelawney is doing one-on-one exams where they're just going to do a crystal ball reading in front of her. So Harry goes to do his and Trelawney is like, what do you see? And he's like, oh, I see Buckbeak. And she's like, oh, do you see Buckbeak getting executed? And he's like, what? No, I, he, he's fine. And then she's like, really? You don't see his head rolling around in blood everywhere? And he's like, no, he's no. like flying away happily. And then Trelawney's like, oh, how sad. So that's really <laughs> depressing. But then as he's about to leave, she like out of nowhere abruptly says, it will happen tonight in a weird voice. And he turns around. And he's like, what'd you just say? And then she goes on this like weird possessed tirade where her like eyes roll roll back in her head and she rambles Ah. about saying stuff like the servant of the dark lord has been separated from his master for 12 years but he will rejoin him tonight before midnight which in my mind is the peter pettigrew disguising himself as scabbers thing because i think that's what happens from the movie but i'm not sure (laughs) um so harry's like oh what's going on and trelawney tries to play it off cool and Harry's like, you just went on a big tirade about the Dark Lord. And she's like, what? No, I didn't. You must have fallen asleep, too, and had a dream. Get out yeah. of here. Uh. And then Harry's like, okay. And he goes back to the tower, and he's like about to tell them what happened. But Ron and Hermione are like super distraught. And he's like, what's going on? And they said, Hagrid just sent us a note that Buckbeak lost the trial. And he told us not to come because he doesn't want to see He doesn't want us to see Buckbeak get murdered. Axed. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So it's sunset, so they can't sneak out. And they're like, oh, we need the invisibility cloak. And Hermione's like, where is it? And Harry's like, oh, it's in the passageway, but Snape would kill me if it's there. And Hermione's like, I'll get it. And they're like, what? And then she gets it. (laughs) So further Mm -hmm. becoming badass Hermione. Yeah. 
So they get the invisibility cloak. They use it to go see Hagrid, uh, and he lets them in. And he's just a mess. Like, he's distraught. He tries to pour him a cup of tea, and he, like, spills milk everywhere and then drops the pitcher, and it breaks, and he knocks stuff over. And Harry's like, yeah, I'll I'll make the tea, (laughs) Hagrid. (laughs) (laughs) Hold on, buddy. So he tells the the guys that Dumbledore is going to come to keep him company, uh, which is really sweet of Dumbledore. And then Hermione sees Scabbers, like, in Hagrid's house. And Ron's like, Scatters, what are you doing here? And he picks him up and he looks atrocious. Like he looks painfully sickly. Ron picks him up and he keeps trying to like flee and get out of his hands and all that. And as he's like kind of fighting with Scabbers, Dumbledore, Fudge, the committee member and the executioner are like on their way. So Hagrid's like, you guys got to get out of here. So the squad leaves. Yeah, you can't be out of the castle at this point. Yeah, you got to get out of here. If you get caught, this is bad news bears. So they leave. While they're doing so, Scabbers freaks the fuck out. And is trying to, like, bite Ron and get away and all this other stuff. And while they're dealing with this, they hear the sound of an axe chopping down. So it is perceived that Buckbeak has been murdered. But I still trust that he could be alive because he's on the cover of the book. So I really feel like like he's not going to die. But that's just me. Uh, And on this incredibly potentially sad note is where we're ending this episode. (laughs) I know. So much sadness and gloominess. I know. I I just picked the chapters of like what will take like about 45 minutes to an hour to discuss uh, based on page number. (laughs) And when I finished reading this this morning, I was like, oh no, this is a terrible place to end. Such a downer. Oh, man. I think one of my favorite things that we learned from this chapter is that Trelawney, like, is an actual seer, right? Uh-huh. She has these fits, uh-huh. but is not conscious of them. And so, like, is constantly, <laughs> like, faking it because she's trying to live up to her family history, but, like, she actually has talent and she doesn't know about it. Yeah, and she, think, fi- she like, that's falls asleep. That's the thing. <laughs> like, she... She's talented, but she doesn't realize it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so sad. So. But she's the worst, so I'm kind of not mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll come to love her. Uh, yeah, Maybe. but no. So that's the end. Uh, this was this was a fun little time, Jordan. Thank you so yeah, much for thanks joining. Thanks so much for having me. No problem. This is great. Good luck with Leaky Con. I'm sure. Thank you. I'm sure that'll be a blast. For the longest yeah. time, I knew Leaky Con was the Harry Potter con- convention, but I uh, I did not know until reading these books that leaky was for like the leaky cauldron. And I was like, Oh, oh. Yeah. I was like, that makes sense. I was like, I was like, why is it leaky? Like the, yeah, we no one's a plumber, <laughs> but I get, I was like, Oh, yeah. the leaky cauldron. That's, that's leaky a fun cauldron. Time. Yeah. So our parent, like back in the day and mm-hmm. like the, the heyday of Harry Potter <laughs> fandom, like the leaky cauldron was the big fan site. And so that's oh. the, our parent company of, uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it's going to be great. You'll definitely have to come to the one next year. Yeah, for and sure. Because in my brain, in my brain, this podcast will soar to new heights and everyone will be like, oh, you're the guy. (laughs) You're super famous reading the Harry Potter book. uh, And even if it doesn't, (laughs) I want to go just to just to be a part of it because I will have read all of the books and maybe all the offspring books like The Cursed Child and Fantastic Beasts and the Quidditch Through the Ages book. Oh, you you could read Fantastic Beasts in like a minute. Yeah, I heard it's really (laughs) short. (laughs) It's tiny. It's tiny. But aren't they making like four movies about it? Five. Five movies. How? The movies... Are they just going to like make shit up? Yeah. So it's essentially just using... The movies are about the author of that book, not about any of its contents. Okay. So you get to see all of his adventures of uh-huh. like coming to get this knowledge to write this book and you'll find out like you don't know some of this stuff yet but there's going to be ways that these new movies tie into the original harry potter movies that's super uh, cool in a way too so we're we're figuring all that out as we go along but it's going to be super fun and it means we get 10 more years of like this harry potter world at least good so. and it means i can find new ways to keep this podcast going yeah <laughs> <laughs> because that would be super fun but yeah jordan thank you so much for joining this was a fun time uh thank and you. and internet thank you so much for listening uh, is there anything you want to any social media stuff you want to plug for people to follow or i would just say if you're interested in leaky con um check us out we're on all the social media media platforms uh, at LeakyCon and LeakyCon.com. You'll have more information about the location and dates for our next convention um, pretty soon, probably by the time this goes up. So be sure to check it out. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much. And as as they say in, in Harry Potter world, a, a wizard on. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> wizard on. Thanks uh, so much. No problem. 
Potterless was created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert, as well as Michael, Leanne Davis, and Griffin Meckleberg, whose dentists always believe them when they say they flossed. And the music is by Bettina Campamanes. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you want to, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. You can find us on Twitter at Potterless Pod, and you can find us at Facebook.com slash Potterless. If pledging money to the podcast in return for bonus things like bonus episodes is intriguing to you, you can go to Patreon.com slash Potterless, and if not, no big deal. Thank you guys again so much for everything, and until next time, as they say at Hogwarts, wizard on!